Okay. <laughs> So um, I'm, I'm uh, really uh, delighted to welcome everybody here today. This is our second uh, webinar in the series for um, uh, 2024. I'm Pamela Forward, President and Founding Director of Whistleblowing Canada Research Society. And uh, I'm joining you from Ottawa, so therefore, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people. Um, so to start, I, I'll just say a little bit about the organization. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, we're a nonprofit registered charity dedicated to advancing education on the whistleblowing phenomena through research and sharing the knowledge publicly. So we truly believe that uh, education can change the world. However, we would be happy with just informing and motivating public policy dialogue and develop around whistleblowing in Canada, an area that has long been neglected. So these discussions then are aimed at increasing awareness and understanding of how encouraging and protecting whistleblowers or truth tellers can help our organizations and governments prevent harm and work better to benefit everyone, organizations and citizens alike. So we're largely a volunteer organization. And so we do thank those of you who have donated for this webinar. Your support is much appreciated. And uh, now to the topic for today, one which is front and center on our TV screens currently, the Chinese Communist Party's global hybrid war, how Canada became a useful idiot. And I'm particularly keen on hearing more about the seemingly cheeky term, useful idiot. Uh, now there's going to be a, a slight change. I will uh, continue uh, as the moderator and uh, Paloma will uh, manage in the background. Uh, so um, just a, a little bit about um, uh, housekeeping, I guess. Uh, I will uh, introduce uh, Dean shortly, uh, and he will uh, present uh, for 30 minutes or maybe a bit more uh, until at least um, uh, quarter to one. So at that time, uh, Dean, you will stop and uh, we will move to questions and answers. So you can either uh, raise your hand or um, you can speak uh, as you wish, or you can uh, write a question in the chat. And we would uh, like to request that you don't use the chat for, um, you know, chatting back and forth during the presentation as it is distracting. Uh, so I think those are all of the details. Uh, and um, we'll now move to our um, speaker for the day. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce Dean Baxendale. Uh, welcome, Dean. He's a distinguished figure in the realms of communication and publicing, uh, publishing. Uh, currently serving as a CEO of Optimum Publishing International and uh, the China Democracy Fund. Uh, with a prolific career that spans various facets of the industry, he's celebrated for his roles as an entrepreneur, a writer, a columnist, a publisher, an educator, and a communication specialist. So Dean's um, academic journey began at the British Columbia Institute of Technology, where he completed a degree in marketing management in 1980. And that was followed by studies in economics uh, at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, Canada. And from a young age, Dean has harbored a deep interest in civic engagement and politics, 
a passion that has informed his lifelong commitment to public policy. And uh, Dean, so the podium is now yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Pamela. It's great to be with everybody here today. And uh, I'm going to put up my presentation now. Hopefully I do this uh, correctly and people will be able to see this. And uh, let me put it up as a slideshow. Is everybody seeing that now? Yes, I could see okay. it. Okay, great. I hope everybody on the webinar can see it. And uh, welcome to today's discussion. And of course, it's uh, somewhat controversial when you call an entire nation uh, a, uh, a party to uh, being part of a hybrid warfare strategy by a malign state government such as the Chinese Communist Party. But quite frankly, this should be nothing new to any of us from the Cold War period prior to uh, China's rise uh, throughout the globe. And certainly the Russians uh, were certainly involved with all forms of hybrid war. And I'll define that the terminology for uh, for everybody a little, little later. Um, but how we became a useful idiot. So the objectives for today's presentation, the definition really, how does a country become a useful idiot in this power struggle? And why history rhymes, the incrementalism of countless commissions reports over the year, years have identified issues within the Canadian system, uh, have identified issues around the objectives, malign objectives of the Chinese Communist Party inside Canada. Uh, those warnings have not been um, adhered to or, or really taken seriously up until the last couple of years when finally we've created a platform and an appetite to have a discussion around foreign interference. And by no means is this, is this limited to the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, the Indian government, as you know, um, did a sanctions uh, assassination here on, on Canada's soil uh, last year. Uh, this is verified by the FBI and various other intelligence agencies. The Americans have always been involved with, in some way, uh, influence Canadian, influencing Canadian politics, uh, and certainly the Russians and the Iranian regimes. So, but the journey, how do we get here? We, I have three case studies that I'm going to talk to you today about that will kind of illustrate this hybrid war uh, and how it's kind of played out over the years. But most importantly, because we're talking about whistleblowers, Whistleblowers come in many forms, and those whistleblowers are people in actual fact who work for agencies such as CSIS, the RCMP, inside the government, as you all well know, uh, but also academics who, who bring forward papers, bring forward their intelligence and their research that open up dialogue. And that's the idea of what a democracy is supposed to be at, uh, doing, which is to have dialogue debate and to move ourselves forward by learning from these experiences. Yet, many times the powers that be are very comfortable with certain narratives and the way in which we are running our country. So we don't we don't actually act upon some of these things. It seems ludicrous, but it is true. How can we support those uh, uh, you know whistleblowers? Uh, the cover up. There is always a cover up. Uh, there is no question in my experience. Uh, Optimum Publishing has been around for close to 50 years. Uh, my father, who started the company, uh, started bringing uh, truth to power forward, including um, a famous book called The Canadian Connection, which outlined the Montreal mob. And it was the first real um, book that really highlighted the infiltration of organized crime in this country. And that relationship between organized crime Politics and business is still there today and plays out in everyday life. So um, I'm going to move on to the next slide and sort of take everyone through this, or I hope to. Um, next slide. So quotes for today. I, I think importantly, I, I wanted to bring three quotes forward because I think they, the, certainly the two on the outside, speak to the narrative that we're talking about today. So Sir Edmund Burke, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men and women to do nothing. Of course, I've modified it for today because Sir Edmund Burke never included women at the time. Um, so, um, you know, and then the most uh, very important one, of course, is the power, um, uh, um, the power narrative with, uh, corrupting absolutely. Um, and then the third one is something that involves me directly. Uh, somebody made an observation to a columnist and said, why does he take on the CCP? 
And that person simply said, because he cannot unsee what he has seen. And I've seen a great deal because I travel in circles uh, that include human rights, uh, that include some of the, the most terrible atrocities by governments around the world. Uh, many of our viewers here today and listeners are, are very aware of, of atrocities that are perpetrated on various uh, people throughout the world, be that Africa, be it Asia, even within our own country, our indigenous peoples too have suffered fr from this uh, for for centuries. So, you know, we need to put this in context. Uh, I've seen a lot. I travel around the globe working with different organizations. I spent a lot of time in Washington, in Ottawa, in London, working with parliamentarians, working with people who are part of committees to bring these narratives forward so there's better understanding by the public so that they can take action. So let's define the, the Canada as a useful idiot in geopolitics. So traditionally, just by the way, the term useful idiot was was kind of coined out of the, the Second World War. Uh, and it was, you know, referring to individuals that that, you know, uh, unwittingly got engaged with uh, because of ideological reasons in some cases, some because they were influenced uh, in some cases because it was for money, uh, ultimately uh operated for and on behalf of foreign governments. Uh, we can go back actually to the sharing of nuclear secrets coming out of Los Alamos, where people who were ideologically um, predisposed to communist uh, Marxist uh, ideology and felt that by sharing our nuclear secrets, uh, we could create a detente and therefore some form of global peace. So those are some of the you know ideas. But here, when it comes to our relationship with the Chinese Communist Party, um, I'm going to talk to the CCP state objectives, including elite capture, economic subversion, and hybrid warfare tactics. And really what we're talking about is hybrid warfare. It has been around for, for years, and I'll explain that a little bit later on. Why does individuals, you know, speak out? And, and you know, what is, what is it that motivates, you know, um, whistleblowers? And really it goes back to the study of deontology, uh, and the understanding that which focuses on the inherent, uh, you know, rightness or wrongness in actions, regardless of the consequences. And many of you know that there are many people who speak out at great risk to themselves, at great risk at times to their families, um, and at great risk to their careers and future economic opportunities. I have met many of those, and I'm going to speak to some of those individuals within the context of this presentation as we move forward. Um, but it speaks to an irrationale that's both ostensibly you know, embed embedded both in the subconscious and certainly at a conscious level as to why somebody speaks out. And you know, this comes down to ethics and actions considered morally right that align with certain moral principles, duties, regardless of the outcome. Now, if only we had our politicians subscribing to such um, such uh, uh, objectives, we would be far better off at times. And now I'm not saying that all politicians uh, don't, uh, are not working for the best public interest, but at times, special interests certainly have motivated individuals to probably take some wrong courses of action. So our, ultimately, honesty and justice is, is one of the biggest things for whistleblowers and why they come, come forward. It's not for money, um, you know, it's not, it, it is because they feel that they need to protect society and their co-workers in the case of, of you know, within their job context. Okay, hybrid war, to war, what is that? So let's go to hybrid warfare. And really, you know, with respect to, to understanding the CCP and, and China's motivations, you know, it goes back to, you know, 2000, 2000 years ago uh, and the art of war. Um, uh, hybrid warfare is also considered what we call gray zone, uh, gray, gray zone warfare. Uh, in the book written over 2000 years ago, The Art of War, Shen Chu basically said, our goal is to win the war before we ever fire a shot. And in most cases, it's, it's our objective not to ever having to take things by force, but taking things through submission. Uh, and a couple of things I will talk about today is elite capture. An elite capture refers to the process by which foreign powers and influence key individuals uh, in the political and economic and social sp spheres to sway policies in their favor. This is done all the time, uh, be it by, you know, be it by special corporate interests. Look at the United States. We can use the example of the gun lobby and the NRA, how 
badly that influences American politics around the firearms specifically, uh, uh, things that we obviously find troublesome in Canada uh, and create a lot of death and mayhem in the United States. Economic subversion. One of the key things of the Chinese Communist Party is to gain control. The BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which was launched uh, under Xi Jinping's regime. Uh, its aim is global domination. Uh, you can look at various textbooks and academics. I can refer, refer you to many on the CCP's global agenda for 2049 and their hegemony. Optima has published a great book on this, um, uh, you know, on the concentration of power by my author, Anders Kaur. Um, and economic subversion happens at all levels. Uh, China has been buying up and controls about 85% currently of the rare earth minerals, which are being used to build the solar panels, being used for the electric batteries that are part of our mission to reduce our emissions. But if a government like the Chinese Communist Party is building a coal plant every week, week how can we be expected to have an effect on the environmental impact by virtue signaling here in Canada and without taking concrete action that holds other governments to account? So that's a little bit about economic subversion. And you'll get into that. Now, I'm not sure if we can play this video or not. Um, I'm going to try. So I'm going to go to share screen and see if it plays. Um, let's go into share this screen. Uh, boom. People can let me know if this is the video, the, the audio is sounding. I don't think it's working, unfortunately. Not working? Okay. Okay. Uh, Zoom share. Boom. Boom. Okay. Uh, basically, what I'll tell. So, in will, uh, so in willful blindness, Optimum Publishing uh, brought forward the narrative from the original Sidewinder investigation, which was conducted jointly by the RCMP and the Canadian Se Security Intelligence Service. That particular unit within CSIS was headed up by a friend and colleague of mine, uh, who should be no stranger to many on this uh, broadcast, uh, Michelle Juno Katsuya. He was the former head of the CSIS Asia Pacific, and he was the first person that sounded the alarm with respect to the linkages between the triads, um, the People's Liberation Army, business tycoons entering the country and influencing our political leaders. Um, so I'm going to go into that that a little bit in the Sidewinder, Sidewinder report and uh, just take you through a couple of things. So background information, you know, um, so the Sidewinder was a collaborative intelligence project between, as I mentioned, CSIS and the RCMP. It investigated Chinese influence and espionage in Canada. And the key figures in that and whistleblowers were Brian McAdam, uh, who worked for Immigration Canada and was a, 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 a revered, um, you know, both ac you know, academically speaking as, as a great um, you know, a person that was working within the within the Canadian government within that department. It also involved, involved Gary Clement, former uh, head of the RCMP's um, uh, money laundering and uh, proceeds of crime division. He actually started it for the RCMP. Gary's been a, a huge advocate for over forty years a, a, of his career, uh, and obviously he did a lot of un sorry, uh, not obviously he did a lot of undercover operations. Uh, and and they brought light to the fact that there was um, immigration fraud within the High Commission in Hong Kong that was allowing individuals to come into the country. Some of those were criminal triads. That was happening through lead, red envelopes, uh, through influence, uh, taking people from the High, High Commission to the racetrack, giving them money, uh, dinners, you name it. Lots of things were done to get those people to uh, be able to move criminals into Canada. That was the first um, process that was identified uh, with it. And, and the report uh, uh, spoke to this. Uh, and we'll talk about the report a little bit later on. But that's sort of the, the, uh, the premise of the first elements of what we call the uh, nomination program to bring immigrants into the country. Um, McAdam and Clement, you know, they, they, you know, high, uh, you know, the complicity and inaction 
you know, of Canadian institutions and actually dealing with this. Brian McAdam uh, was brought back to Ottawa, put into a fax room in the basement and quietly shut up. Uh, and this case is known to whistleblowers for a long time. And uh, Michelle Junius Katsuyi's report uh, remained dormant, was buried by his boss and other officials within CSIS because it was A, embarrassing, uh, B, it wasn't a narrative that at the time that world governments want, wanted to see come out. And that was that China was emerging. China was a great opportunity. It was a panacea and that they would liberalize on human rights uh, and fundamental worker rights and allow free speech. All of these things were you know, being pushed by academics the world over. So everybody was fooled by believing that that would be an outcome. But we know the Chinese Communist Party is a totalitarian regime. So, you know, their actions were met with derision. Gary was moved off to the side. He re reconstituted himself within the RCMP. As far as Michelle goes, he left CSIS, uh, you know, just out in 2000, uh, but has carried on in his work and his role uh, in the private sector in do it, uh, running investigations uh, and operations to uncover wrongdoing inside the country uh, by other state state actors for, for, for that time. Um, so the challenges and repercussions, though, of course, of the whistleblowing were, you know, they faced the significant professional and personal challenges, obviously career setbacks, um, public skepticism, of course. Um, you know, the media sometimes is used to to tamp down these narratives. Um, and on the other side, the, the media also elevates them. So uh, McAdam lost his job, faced severe depression, personal professional persecution. Um, and he was vindicated somewhat through willful blindness when we published that. And late last year, when we brought out the Mosaic Effect, which had a secondary report that backed up Sidewinder, which was a covert operation run by the Americans. It's a story that I broke in Washington, Operation Dragon Lord with the CBC. Uh, you can find that online. Um, so you can, so I was able to get the story out. Um, outcomes and impact. You know, you know, despite the suppression of whistleblowers. Um, you know, obviously, people started to, you know, within intelligence circles, took all of this seriously. Certainly, the U.S. did. The U.S. has never stopped looking at what's been going on in Canada uh, for obvious reasons. Um, and, you know, the analytics and implications of this are such that that it took until this, the Operation Dragon Lord report was released some 20 years for vindication to truly come uh, for people like Michelle, uh, people like Gary. Uh, and people like Brian McAdam, specifically around the subject of CCP infiltration, triads, organized crime, and their influence on Canadian politics. Um, and that story continues on today. Um, so that's a little bit about, about the sidewinder. You can ask me questions later. This one is holding a pen in one hand and a gun in the other. This is a paper written by Professor Anne-Marie Brady, presented to the Parliament in New Zealand, then published by the Wilson Center in, um, in Washington. Uh, and what happened was the Chinese Communist Party uh, through United, the United Front Works Department uh, basically did a campaign to try to have Anne-Marie Brady censored and expelled from her role as professor at, at her university in New Zealand. Now, this started to get some attention globally because it's interesting that, you know, a government who had her speak to the paper and to which it was widely accepted, but then the CCP started to go after her at her university um, and started to go after in public. They started a campaign uh, to discredit her. And that's when an organization uh, called the China Democracy Fund, which I was involved with as one of the founding members of that organization. And basically we mobilized um, at a number of different levels um, to bring the story forward, not just in New Zealand, but obviously put global pressure on the university, uh, on the government to, to uh, stand up for Professor Anne-Marie Brady. The premise of the paper was simply this, that, and we've now done legislation in Canada, thank goodness, uh, that uh, that was this paper demonstrated that professors from China, uh, under perhaps the direction and influence of the Chinese government, were sharing critical data 
and intelligence that could be applied to military applications that would adversely affect our advantage uh, in democracies, but ultimately for the Chinese Communist Party to use in their own weapons programs. So it's espionage, and it's being done through a nice way and calling it collaborative research. And we all believe in collaboration. I was one of the big promoters of it starting back in the 90s and global collaboration. But the reality is we have to have parameters on that. So, so the we set up a camp, we raised funds for to for her legal defense because she had legal bills that she had to do. We did a globe mobilized and did a global media campaign where we where we placed articles, editorials in newspapers, um, you know, from Washington to New York to London to Canberra, um, you know, uh, as well as in New Zealand. In the end, we had to resort, not resort, but we, because of our uh, group that had formed together, uh, including academics, uh, former intelligence people, publishers, editors, writers, um, but people very knowledgeable about the situation, uh, with obviously diplomatic ties. We also engaged the diplomatic apparatus in both the United States, Australia, here in Canada, uh, and New Zealand to put pressure on the government uh, to step in and stop this, this process. And ultimately, that was successful. Um, uh, Anne-Marie Brady had to change one line, I believe, in her paper, which I guess showed that there was some contrition on her part. But ultimately, the paper stood on its own. You can read about this case. It's out there. You can. Um, it, there's a lot of information about it, but it's a great case study in an academic coming forward, telling the story about uh, a regime and their objectives mm -hmm. and how they tried to shut her up. It also, by the way, included her house being bur burglarized, um, uh, threats to her, threats to her family. This is what the CCP often does in tactics um, uh, around the globe. And I've been subject and my authors have been subject to that. Many of my authors have been beaten um, and uh, certainly uh, have been impacted by the CCP. Their, their relatives disappear into camps in the Uyghur region and Xinjiang. Uh, this is an evil empire. And yet the Canadian establishment and our business elite want to continue to do work with this regime. Okay. But let's have the public at least be aware of what's going on. And that's what whistleblowers and publishers try to do is bring that narrative forward. So let's move that forward now to where we sit. Um, and I talked a little bit, about, you know, went through all this, the analysis and implications. But bottom line, Anne-Marie Brady is, has full standing. Um, she's working well, uh, despite the psychological, um, you know, torture and torment that she had. Uh, she's on solid footing, uh, presenting new papers, doing great research, and furthering the interests of democracy within her context as a professor in New Zealand. Um, so let's talk about the PNP scandal, something that many people might be aware of. And as I mentioned earlier, how does this all come together? Uh, I wanted to present this case about hybrid warfare, um, but we allowed in this country as mentioned, through Sidewinder and also through the Dragon Lord report, um, highlights this nexus uh, between the triad criminals, the People's Liberation Army, and the United Front Works Department that works inside our country to influence our politicians. Um, the PNP program in PEI and throughout the country was an opportunity for immigrants to come from all over the world, and these were economic immigrants, uh, in the case of of, of uh, PI, it was two hundred thousand dollars. They were supposed to be investing in a business, but I can tell you there was no business in the end that they were involved in. But that money went to key individuals throughout Prince Edward Island and businesses, innocent businesses, businesses as well. But if I showed you the number of corporations and they number in the thousands that were opened up by people that were connected to the government. And for the money to, to flow into those accounts, it is absolutely astonishing. And one of the key individuals uh, around this was a person by the name of Susan Holmes uh, and Cora Nicholson. Cora worked for the government looking over the various um, uh, applications uh, when they would recommend that, that a person not be let in because they didn't qualify, uh, when the nighttime staff would come in and override that. Or there was the ongoing joke that the fifth floor which was the premier's office, had ultimately 
adjudicated and made a decision to bring somebody in who was not qualified or who they believed uh, did not meet the criteria of the program. And as a matter of fact, I'm told the numbers are as high as over 80% that actually did not qualify to come in. But there was a rush in 2009 to 2008 to bring people in. And in a period of about three months, various people from PEI government traveled all over the world to try to get new immigrants into the into the country. And they rammed through about 2,000 uh, uh, through that. The reason why? The Canadian government in Ottawa, the immigration candidate said, oh my God, this is not what we intended the program for. There are a lot of holes here. There are a lot of problems. And, and CSIS and the RCMP had identified that people were coming through into this country who were known criminals. Those criminals, by the way, uh, and United Front for Works people and some agents is documented in a number of papers in Willful Blindness and certainly in the book, The Mosaic Effect as well. Um, but these are all there and, the, you know, and verifiable. Um, but the interesting thing about PI was only three in 10 actually showed up in PI. So the other seven ended up in Vancouver and in Toronto, the majority being Vancouver. Uh, and that we can trace actual people that came to Vancouver and a whole bunch of buying up of properties uh, over the next few years. And we can all say, well, this is great having all this money coming into our country, uh, buying up properties. But as we know, a uh, housing crisis in part was created by the uh, supply and demand issues around money go chasing after too few properties. This again is documented in, in numerous uh, books, papers, and by academics. Um, so in the case of Susan though, she actually was working within the uh, educational secretariat within the government. They were tasked to look at a contract award that was an outcome of the PNP of people coming to the island. And that was to teach English uh, as a second language and to provide language training services for immigrants coming to the country, not just Chinese immigrants, or be they from Iran, Russia, wherever they were coming from. This was a, a noble program and a noble cause and, and obviously something that we should invest in if we want to have people come to our country, feel comfortable, be able to have command of the English language, get jobs uh, and, and, and integrate with our society overall and become, you know, contributing members to that society, to that society. Um, there were, uh, but there was uh, two contract bids for this. There was three, but one didn't ultimately um, uh, send their, their application in. Uh, they, one was Holland College. Uh, and the other was uh, a company owned by Frank Zhao, who is also known as a Red Princeling, which means he, he is a third generation Red Princeling, which means he's tied to the founding fathers of communism in the Mao era. Um, he is identified by various intelligence agencies as a United Front Works Department uh, individual, uh, is seen shaking hands with Xi Jinping all the time. Uh, he came to Prince Edward Island, and they opened up another company. Not only did they adjudicate and 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 uh, process applicants, but they also had uh, Sunrise Education. Um, when the analysis was done, twelve people rated uh, Holland College's bid uh, superior, and none of them had recommended that Sunrise get the contract. Yet they were awarded a four million dollar contract. Interestingly enough. They had a business, and this is where we get into elite capture, with the then premier, not, not uh, sorry, the premier who was about to come in, and that was Robert, was, was McLaughlin. And they had formed a uh, company with Anne of China, Inc. And that was to sell the idea of Anne of Green Gables to China, uh, which sounds great and wonderful. And actually the foreword was even written by the Stephen Harper's uh, wife. Uh, we had all sorts of people endorsing this, and that's the way, which is great. And, and and if we think about that, that's a wonderful idea and enterprise. No one's ever seen any money or reports from that that company with respect to how PII I is benefiting and how the foundation for um, for Maude Montgomery are benefiting. But bottom line is, if you have a business and you're in the liberal government and you ultimately working with somebody and you have influence over decisions, it's maybe easy to see why the contract was awarded to Sunrise over Holland, even though 
12 people said no, uh, that it should go to Holland College. But that is how elite capture sometimes works. And sometimes, you know, at the end of the day, we just want to do business with our friends. But I think that people who are watching this podcast will recognize that we need to have accountability. We need to have transparency. And that's some of the things that were missing, certainly from that particular PNP contract. Now, we were on the island uh, two weeks ago. We did a presentation to Islanders uh, where over 600 or close to 600 Islanders showed up for an event. And uh, that's PEI in the front, front line, Canada under siege. And ostensibly, we are there to provide and inform and create a platform and a knowledge base of Islanders to understand how influence operations work, the ambitions of the Chinese Communist Party globally, how that interplays and how that's worked inside Canada, political interference, which we now have the subject of an inquiry, as you well know, in Ottawa. That inquiry in part is the, you know, because of, uh, authors like Sam Cooper, like Stephen Chase and Bob Fife, uh, Terry Glavin and people before him, Jonathan Manthrop, that, you know, suggested that, you know, there's a lot of things going on in your Canada that we're not addressing. The election interference is one thing and involved the consulate. There are there's lots of evidence, a lot of information still to come out there. I'll be in Ottawa next week to attend a number of those, those meetings. But this event was the idea it was to educate and inform. And it's how Whistleblowers can also, you know, you know, bring narratives forward. Um, but the reaction was great. We were originally boycotted by, you know, certain uh, media people. Uh, but afterward, um, we received a, a, a very good. Um, after I, I posted the video about the event, we received a very good report from CBC, who who did what. I hope what they would do was play this right down the middle and do exactly what we wanted to do is to inform people, create a platform of knowledge so they can make their own decisions and take action. The results of this are a mobilization of people on the island to start to hold their politicians accountable because all of a sudden they saw things from a geostrategic, geopolitical level running right back down inside their, their province. Uh, and the corruption with PNP is just one thing that they're very upset about over the years, but they're also upset about land transfers and potential um, uh, ownership of tracts of land uh, by a particular group that uh, it was originally from Taiwan. Uh, and one thing we have to be very careful of is to make sure that the na narrative is not about China or about uh, Chinese people. This is about the Chinese Communist Party whenever we're talking about these narratives. Uh, and I'm very careful because many of my friends uh, are from the China diaspora community, from the Uyghur community, from the Tibetan community, from Taiwan. I was at an event in Toronto last night speaking to that, or I was asked to speak, uh, surprisingly so, uh, but uh, to, to address uh, some of these uh, issues. Um, but um, this is happening at a high level. People just need to understand that it's going on. Then the public can make their own decisions. It's, uh, you know, by uh, becoming knowledgeable about the subjects. Um, so Susan, and, and there's more coming out on what's going on in PI over the next little while. And as we've mobilized some more media who are very interested in really doing a, a much, much deeper dive um, on that. So recommendations in making the case, you know, for whistleblowers, because ultimately um, all of these different narratives uh, come into creating uh, and informing me and informing others about a bigger issue. But let's get down to the brass tacks of, you know, simple cases uh, for whistleblowers. You know, how do we make the case? Uh, as we know, oftentimes whistleblowers are, are lo lost. They're trying to figure out what to do. Who should they speak to? Who should they go to? Who can they trust? So first of all, make sure you have your documents, you know, um, uh, print them out if you if you're not going to digitize them. But if you have have these things, you need to have the evidence. You need to have the 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 uh, the proof. Write out a case, you know, for corruption or malfeasance. What what's happening? What do you see? Um, and understand where the buck stops. Is it just somebody directly, you know, a coworker? Is it systemic within the organization? Is it management? Does it go to the executive level within your corporation uh, that you or in the government department that's covering up things that you feel are not based on the standards and ethics which you signed up on uh, for for your job? Talk, you know, with your close 
friends and your family. Obviously, this is really important. Um, you know, basically make sure that that what you're talking about sounds right, sounds or, or that they can challenge you and you can answer the questions. Um, don't see yourself as a victim. You're not a victim. People are not victims. Corporations are not victims. Um, but they are often made to be uh, and, and, and pushed uh, and suppressed. And, and ultimately, they feel victimized by the situation. But remember, you are an individual. There are groups like Whistleblowers Canada that can come forward um, to help support you. And then obviously, there's media. So also, I will recommend, obviously, always seek professional legal advice. Spending that $500 for an hour with a really good lawyer, um, and I'm sure that Whistleblowing Canada can you know, potentially you know, uh, have resources here to point you in that right right direction. There's stuff on the website already, um, but it's really important to get that legal advice. Know what your case is, um, and and oftentimes you should do that before you go go forward. Oftentimes people don't, and it comes afterward. Know what your rights are. Know what your protections do you have, especially around NDAs. There's when you sign off on an NDA when you're forced to leave an organization. If there's a legal activity going on or has been going on, there is no, that NDA is, is useless in a court of law. The, uh, the corporation or government cannot say they signed the NDA, uh, therefore they cannot bring this forth. And as it can't be more false, and I have to emphasize that, that fact, but it, once again, seek legal advice on that. But always set your goals and objectives, understand what your objectives are and how you wanna get there. This is really important. Um, and, and some of the things above in the making the case are, are steps that you're going to go through. Who does it include? Do you, are you going to go to the police? And at what level are you going to go to the police about? Oftentimes, you can take a very complex case to the RCMP, and depending on the level, they may look at you like, wow, I don't really understand. I don't get this. Uh, this is really, you know, I, I, you know, I think you're wrong. You, you need to, to go back. You need to figure out who you're going to go to. And once again, Getting the right advice and direction can help out there. Um, so does it include journalists bringing that story out? As you know, many of the stories that have come out, including Sidewinder and Marie Brady's case and the PNP and, 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 and PI, have all been the subject of major stories, including in the PNP case, a W5 documentary in 2019. Um, so the media is really important in bringing your story out, potentially, if it's significant enough. Don't be afraid of that, but once again, have a plan. What are your objectives? Uh, and please understand that there are ramifications, naturally, of going public with this. Um, advocacy groups like the whistleblowers, whistleblower groups, and whistleblowing Canada is important. You know, as a resource, uh, talk to talk to these people. They have great perspective and advice. So, having the solid uh, framework, remove the emotion out of the equation because oftentimes when we write our documents and we're talking about this. It is filled with our pain sometimes. It's filled with the anxiety. It's filled with the pressure. Sometimes we end up in depression. I'm not I'm speaking collectively here now. Uh, and so try to remove the emotion. It's hard to do, but you need to be objective and make sure before you send any document or any email, use the 24 hour rule on that one um, and make sure you get it checked and vetted uh, and make sure that your case is solid based on facts, information uh, that you can back up and that will help you move the case forward and have people take you take you seriously. Advocate for yourself. I can't emphasize this enough. Uh, and have people around you who are strong enough to support you. Um, this is really, really important to uh, uh, because you you are your own, you know, uh, best. Uh, you're the person that understands what's going on. You understand the the depths of potential, you know, criminal wrongdoing or or bad business practices or unethical business practices taking place in a workplace. Um, and, and you need to advocate for yourself and stay strong because it's often difficult to do that. Look for those support groups once again to do that. So um, I just wanna say, first of all, a thank you uh, for today. I, I, uh, I'm open to lots of questions, uh, of, of course, if there are any. Um, and, and thank you. You know, uh, we bring truth forward. Um, and uh, that has been our ma mantra for, you know, over 50 years as a publisher. But me as a human rights advocate, 
um, and somebody who uh, works with uh, with governments uh, and uh, individuals and associations, uh, all who have a cause or are trying to bring things forward and advocate for truth, uh, human rights, religious freedoms, civil rights, free speech rights. These are all important subjects that underpin our very democracy. And if we let these things go, allowing governments to to put in suspect legislation that might undermine those rights, uh, advocating for stronger whistleblower rules and laws to protect those individuals. And let's not treat them as they often have been, as something bad because they brought it forward. No, these people are standing for freedom and democracy and a better way of life for all of us. They need our support. And I thank you uh, for this opportunity to talk today. Thank you, uh, Dean. Uh, it's really um, a, a wonderful pleasure to connect with someone who's been, um, you know, right down there at the ground level, involved in all of the details, uh, and who knows intimately uh, what these people uh, go through, and uh, you know, as you said, the, the truth of what they're bringing forward. So um, there are a few uh, points that I'm going to make before the end, but before I jump in, I'm not going to take advantage of my privileged position as moderator here. I'm going to allow uh, any of you who uh, would like to uh, ask a question of Dean, if you would please do so, uh, just raise your hand or... Um, Make a noise, <laughs> speak, and uh, you will have the floor. It's silence. Yes, silence. Okay, well, um, maybe I can start um, just to... Um, get things going, Dean. I really appreciated uh, some of the advice that you were giving whistleblowers. I have to say though, <clears throat> you know, in spite of their best efforts many times, and you know, we'll talk about the PNP uh, example, they will go up the line. They will go everywhere. They will go to the media. They will go to the minister. They'll go to the prime minister. They'll go to the premier. They'll go to the RCMP. Um, the newspapers are full of what's going on. Does anything get corrected? Does anything get done? Sadly, too often, absolutely nothing happens. So what does this say? to our democracy and, and our democratic institutions, you know, uh, when our, um, uh, our police force doesn't investigate, they don't enforce the law, they don't uphold the law, what, what do we do? Well, uh, you know, a, a, a great question, and 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 obviously, uh, an ast obviously, an astute observation overall in terms of of how um, you know the democracy uh, is imperiled uh, when we see individuals uh, attempting uh, to get to all levels um, and to bring a, a narrative and a complaint forward, but are shunned uh, aside. Uh, but this also speaks to the media in some cases where they print false stories about people and then put a retraction on page 17, um, you know, some days later. Uh, and there has to be accountability for media organizations. I mean, I was involved with the We Charity uh, book. Um, there is a, you know, ongoing over $10 million lawsuit against the Canadian Broadcast Corporation for the for the work that they did on um with with their uh, documentary show um i think that there were once again uh, this became a political football for the opposition to try to saddle the prime minister and the um uh, and the finance minister with uh with a narrative of you know uh 
nepotism, et cetera. Uh, there's no question that that we charity did some things wrong, uh, but there was nothing, you know, there is no malfeasance to the extent that uh, the CBC news documentary tried to to paint uh, and say that they were doing wrong. They, they were doing good for humanity. Um, and they had a different way and model in which to deliver that, which was not necessarily in keeping with many. Now, I think there was many transgressions, but the media was particularly egregious and way overstepped their bounds. Uh, and ultimately, that's why the case is being heard in Washington, uh, where CBC could face, actually could face $100 million in damages. I'm not sure. Unfortunately, the taxpayers might have to pay for that. Uh, hopefully, they just settle uh, in some, some fashion. But I think public, that's sometimes, unfortunately, I hate to say it, uh, the only way that people get uh, vindication. Uh, but at a lower level, I think you have to stay true. Um, again, sometimes you're going to need to recalibrate and, and build out a new strategy on how you move the narrative forward. Right. Um, and to, to add to that, uh, what makes it more incumbent on the media to, uh, <clears throat> to get it right is the fact that now what we're hearing, and I've heard this from a number of whistleblowers, who go to their members of parliament, right? They've tried everything else in desperation. They go to their members of parliament. Uh, in one case, uh, they, uh, the uh, member of parliament and the, the party investigated, uh, found that, you know, his uh, complaints were correct and founded. But in the end, what all, what all the parties seem to be saying now is, they can't raise anything in Parliament unless there is first a story in the media. So uh, now <laughs> we have to look to the media, uh, you know. Well, and, yeah, and, and, and unfortunately, our government, you know, why do we need them if they're not doing the oversight they need to be doing? Yeah, well, you know, it's a good question. And ultimately, I, I do have to say, when you know, in PI, what we've seen from the outcome of PI, ultimately, is citizens being engaged to hold government to account. I hate to say this, but that is where we are headed within this democracy, because uh, the government is not, if it narrative is too uncomfortable, if the narrative speaks to uh, malfeasance, if the narrative speaks to corruption, Governments obviously don't want that story out, and they have a vested interest in suppressing it. By the way, both parties or all parties at times are guilty of this, especially on a number of different files that many people here would be familiar with. But ultimately, yes, the people are going to have to push, and I hate to say it, yes, you, oftentimes you're going to have to get that story into the media. Now, what makes that difficult, if the media is being supplemented by the government, where does the objectivity lie there in editorial decisions. And I know for a fact, um, as somebody who's a, a veteran with lawfare uh, uh, by, by malign state forces and uh, with the Chinese Communist Party specifically, uh, that tactic, how it's used against individuals and the media, and we're very aware of media influence operations by governments around the world to suppress certain narratives coming forward. At the end of the day, you just have to find an individual uh, a group within within an organization, within a media organization, that's going to hear you and listen to you, because ultimately they too are going going to be bound by you know the the their oath to uh, you know performing journalism at high standards and bringing truth and truth narratives to the public, and so that's what we've got to rely on in part. Uh, Ombudsmen within the government need to do a better job, need to have a bigger department. And they need to advocate for citizens and people within the government, as somebody rightly pointed out on the chat, uh, don't seem to recognize that they're not serving themselves, but they are duty bound to serve the interests of the public. That is their job. That is what the job of the politicians are. Now, these are very complex, depending, you know, and, and how that all gets, uh, how the sausage gets made at the end. But the reality is, accountability you are accountable to the public yes so it sounds like what you're saying is never give up but 
understand, understand that ultimately <clears throat> the power lies with the people and nothing's going to change unless the people mobilize to um, uh, campaign for change. Uh, that so we so it looks like you're saying we need to create a public will to campaign that that is strong enough to create the political will because the political will just isn't there to change anything. Uh, they seem to like the status quo. It serves them well. So in the end, it's up to all of us. And um, I, I hope that, uh, you know, many more people will eventually learn about these webinars and learn about what is really going on in our country because it is really concerning and really heartbreaking. For example, if I could add, Dean, to what you said, uh, you know, about letting in the, the criminals, uh, it, it wasn't just the money laundering. Where did the money come from? These criminals brought with them human trafficking they brought with them drug trafficking. They brought with them addictions that are killing our sons and daughters, our brothers and sisters, our mothers and fathers. And if we don't get it, if we don't understand what's behind it, and then to have the Cullen Commission of Inquiry into money laundering saying nobody could be charged for doing nothing because there was no will on the part of the senior people. Well, how many of us get paid for doing a job that we don't have the will to do and we therefore don't do it? Uh, I mean, this is ridiculous. This is what now, I mean, this is a, supposedly a, a respected um, uh, judge, a former judge, I think he's yeah. retired now. He's a former yeah. judge. And this is not the first time that this has come forward. Same thing happened in the tainted blood scandal, the Creever inquiry. Nobody was charged. Uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't anybody's fault. It was just th the system's fault. There was no will to do anything. Well, yeah. it, there was no will for the RCMP to charge anybody either in that situation. So we have major issues in all of our um, democratic institutions, you know, creating the law, upholding the law, you know, the, the public service, uh, enforcing the law, the RCMP. Um, it, it's a, a big uh, question for us to ponder on. So I haven't heard anything from anybody. Um, it's now one o'clock. So I'm going to give you one more minute. Anybody? I see Edgar Smith smiling away. I'm sure, Ed, you've got a question or a comment to make. I'm going to start naming names here. I see another big smiling face. I see Ian Braun smiling away. Uh, can, you, uh, can you unmute them? Uh, I think you have no, they'll unmute. They can unmute themselves. I think they've done that. Okay, go. Sorry, could I ask or could I say something? Yes. Who is speaking? Sorry, it's Jessica. I couldn't raise my hand. I didn't know oh, how. Oh, hi, Jessica. <laughs> hi. Yes. Um, I I just wanted to say uh, that was a great presentation, and thank you so much. And uh, I especially I I found your um your checklist of what a whistleblower should do in order to protect and advocate for themselves. I thought that was brilliant and that should be written everywhere. Um, and I wish I would have had that. Um, and uh, I think it's really sad. Uh, it's a sad commentary on how we are in Canada in terms of having any kind of protections that that list doesn't include. Yep any any second step any 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 protection from the government any protection in the form of a law it's just how can you protect yourself and minimize the impact to your life um and that just it breaks my heart um and i think part of it is we need to mobilize 
with each other. We need to connect with each other. We need to figure out what the best ways to to fight our fights. What's the best way to do that um, for each of us individually, because we're all in different places and in different industries. And then I think when we talk to the media and when we put out things, we have to be strategic. Uh, and I think we can be ethical and strategic at the same time because mm -hmm. journalists will be. Um, they, like you said, the story has to be compelling uh, and it has to get eyes and it has to make money. So um, we have to be smart with the way that we present that information to the media so that they will want to put stories out there. Uh, and in the same way, the public will only care when it's in their backyard. Yes. all of, I don't know your individual case, obviously. Um, I understand your your pain. Uh, and, and, many, and by the way, Optimum brought up the book on the tainted blood blood crisis, the new new one about four years ago. Uh, and we and we summarized it specifically around the actions or inactions by the government uh, called bad blood. Uh, that became, of course, the documentary series in part that you saw on CBC. Uh, uh, but, but yes, it, what getting together, uh, finding um, really, you know, um, I hate to use AA as an example here, but AA does a great job in terms of bringing people together and having support groups. So I, I think that that you know that is absolutely important uh, because the par the. Uh, as I like to call it, the epidemiology or the, the the nature of whistleblowers and what they go through is very similar in every single case because it's based on, as I said, moral and ethical principles as to why they went ahead in the first place in which to go ahead and blow the whistle. So, but within that, each individual case needs to be addressed and 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 and, and discussed separately, but. There's a there's a common line, common thread, and you can apply those same principles, as I said, in a checklist or what and how you advocate for yourself. And how do you go to the media, media training? Uh, I'll, I'll be happy to do media training on, on this. I've, I've done this for other groups specifically uh, and advocating for themselves down the road. Um, but yes, it does require a collective effort of everybody to help bring your story forward and to get that support. So the power and the strength of uh, forming allies, uh, like-minded people. Uh, that's, Absolutely. that's been a principle of um, uh, public citizen motiva motivation for a long, long time. Well, it, it, I see it's 105, uh, so uh, we are a few minutes past our time. Uh, and thank you so much, Dean, for staying uh, over time and you as well, uh, Paloma, even though you're behind the scenes, uh, thank you so much for your help. Right. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And please, oh, hi, Kirk, did you have something to say? Yeah, yeah. hi, how are you doing? Uh, okay, how are you? Well, uh, <laughs> that's a loaded question, but thanks for, I haven't talked to you for a long time. I really appreciate all your the hard work you guys do. Um, yesterday, I had an interesting conversation with the RCMP again where they all say that my case is too far above their pay grade. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I've been talking to the politicians. They they block me. You know, uh, it's been like that for five years. I'm finally getting a little headway here. Um, just recently in December, I'm, I know none of you know my story except maybe Pamela, but uh, recently in December, I was reassessed by the military uh, doctors and uh, they say I'm 111 percent mentally disabled, which I assure you I'm not. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, Kirk. Um, you know, there's a number of stories that I'm aware of. Uh, oh yeah, similar to yours, and perhaps we can talk afterwards, and maybe uh, you know I can connect some of you so that you can you know join your experiences and see what you can learn. Uh, from them and how you can support each other because they are, uh, you know, military connected, you know, with uh, military, either current or former. So uh, with that, then, uh, thank you, everybody. Oh, sorry, Dean, did you want to sorry, say? Just be, yeah, sorry. Pamela. First of all, thank you very much for organi organizing this uh, today. It's been great to be on here. Uh, if anybody wants to get a hold of me, I noticed some comments here. 
um, uh, uh, you know, with respect to uh, the whole um, situation vis-a-vis -vis, uh, triad, um, you know, infiltration into the country, et cetera. Happy to talk about that separately. If somebody wants to reach out to me, by all means, you can get my email from Pamela. You can get it through my website. Um, and I'm always here as a resource um, and uh, when I can be. Um, and listen, this, th this cause is noble. Uh, bringing this forward, and and I, you know, I applaud Pamela and and all of, all of those that are involved with this group for trying to advocate and move the needle forward in Canada. It really, truly needs to be done, and I'm happy to be associated with with your organization. So thank oh, you. And, and we're happy we found you, Dean, or you found us. We're not sure who found who, but you know, just you know the, there's somebody who is focusing on this and who gets it. And, uh, you know, the, the books you've written, I don't know if I'll ever manage to get through them. I don't think my head will ever come up above water. But uh, again, thank you, <laughs> folks. And uh, please don't hesitate. I'm sure Dean means every word he says. Okay, bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.